Yeah, luckily. Hello, everybody. It's the Meister from Brews and Tunes. Cheers. I am uh, incredibly excited. Today, I am chatting with a pivotal character in the death metal world, uh, Mike Browning of Nocturnus AD, and of course, Nocturnus and Morbid Angel and multiple other cool bands. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Mike. I'm really excited to be chatting with you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Awesome. How, how are you doing? How are things going? Uh, pretty good. You know, just trying to stay busy uh, with us, all this COVID stuff. There's not a, you know, there's a lot of different things going on. Things are so different now than they were, you know, three years ago. Just right. the, the whole music scene has just changed. I mean, the, the, nobody's touring hardly and their tours are getting canceled. And uh, But the good thing is uh, that what I've understood is that when a band puts out a record now since COVID, that they've been selling really well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's got its good points and bad points, but for the people that try to uh, make a living off of touring and stuff, you know, bands like Cannibal and stuff like that, you know, they took a pretty bad hit. A lot of, yeah. you know, obituary Cannibal bands that make a lot of money and that's what they do for a living. You know, so many bands didn't do anything for over a year. Right. Yeah, that's rough. Um, have, have you been, have you been, you know did you have shows lined up did you you know did you have to cancel a lot of uh, any shows any touring yourself well the thing with us is we all have um steady jobs and family type situations and things so we never really did a bunch of touring and shows a year we kind of tried to focus on the bigger festivals and mm. do about maybe three or four a year and that way we could still hit a lot of people live you know, because like when we do Maryland Death Fest, you know, you got 5,000 people there. If we yeah. do you know, Brutal Assault, you got like 10,000 people there. You know, we did um, Health Fest once, which was, you know, over 100,000 people at that festival. Wow. So the good thing is we can, we've been able to get on a lot of these festivals in the past few years. And uh, well, maybe not the past two years, but, you know, before that. And so we don't have to do you know, a lot of bands will go out for three months on tour and and play a bunch of shows in the smaller clubs. And, you know, so since we can't do that, we've been trying to get good festivals, you know, the, the medium size and the bigger ones. And then, um, you know, with that, we can at least get a lot of people to see us. Nice. And it kind of makes things a little more special. I mean, some bands have toured so much, you know, oh, I've seen this band 10 times. You know, the first five were great, but then after that, it starts becoming like, okay. Yeah. You know, I know what they're going to do. I, you know, might be a couple new songs, but it's going to be the same, you know, show over and over. So I think um, so in some ways, the way we do things and only do a few shows a year kind of makes them more special. <clears throat> right. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, uh, you know, speaking of, of, of music, our, our, you know, this past year and a half, you know, with everything kind of shut down, have you been working on any new music? Have you been writing at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. That's the one good thing. Uh, and again, with the fact that we all have jobs, we only practice on, on Saturdays oh. um, for, for about three hours on Saturday night. And um, so we've been working on the next album. And uh, again, it's going to be like nine songs, like, like Paradox, and one will be an instrumental. And we actually have eight songs written already. Seven of them have lyrics. And so we only really have, we're going to do another instrumental uh, to close out the next album. So that's the only thing we have to write now. And I got like one more song to write lyrics to. Nice. So, um, yeah, it's coming along really well. I'm really happy with the new songs. Uh, they're, I would say, pretty close to the vein of what Paradox was. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and lyrically, it's... it. Um, the reason I did not turn as AD was was to continue everything that was on the key because there were several. It, the key was like mainly four. The last four songs on the key were main, the main key story. Yeah. Um, and then other stuff like Standing in Blood and Lake of Fire. Kind of, kind of my uh, my uh, those two kind of fit together to make a little story. And then Neolithic was its own kind of thing, and you know so. Um, on Paradox, I wanted to continue Neolithic, you know, um, so, and we did with Paleolithic, and I wanted to continue the key story with, again with four songs, so we did that, the last four songs uh, besides from the instrumental, 
and uh like you know five six seven and eight those last four songs those four songs there where the key story continued from the key yeah and so i wanted to do the same exact thing almost setup wise with this next album so we have four songs again that continue the key story oh cool from where paradox left off then we have another song that continues neolithic and paleolithic called mesolithic Wow, and cool. these are actually, you know, in line, you know, like history, history uh, situations in time of what was going on with mankind, you know, starting. And so we got that song. And then um, the weird thing was like Lake of Fire and Standing in Blood kind of made their own little story. And um, so we continue that on Paradox with Seizing the Throne. So it went, if you look at the lyrics, it's Lake of Fire stand standing in blood and seizing the throne right but then i realized what was really strange was um on the 1987 nocturnus demo we had a song called nocturnus and that those lyrics were actually the next part of the story of seizing the throne after seizing the throne oh cool so what we're gonna do um and we've already kind of done this anyway um but we we kind of rehashed that song Nocturnus, 90% of it's the same, but we've added a couple new little parts here and there and kind of updated some things. So it's pretty much the same song. All the lyrics are the same. Um, but so we're going to do that as a bonus track. Very cool. So there'll actually be 10 songs on, on the next album. I haven't really got a title for, for the next album yet. Okay. Uh, even like Paradox, I didn't come up with that till we were, you know... <laughs> After we wrote the songs, I was still thinking, what's a good, you know, because on the key, there was never a song called The Key. Right. You know, so, uh, but we did Return of the Lost Key on, on Paradox, you know. So I want to come up with another title that doesn't really have anything to do with any of the song titles, but it's got to work in conjunction with the story, of course, yeah. you know. So th this next album is going to be very similar to the way Paradox was set up. Cool. Um, and it, it, you know, then there'll be a couple extra songs, uh, like three songs that kind of just stand on their own. Nice, nice, very cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean I've got I've got a copy right here of Paradox. It is awesome. such a great album. It's brilliant. I mean, and it's so cool that that you and I was really curious about you know the continuation of these storylines. You know, after thirty years, you know, it's been an almost thirty year you know window. Of, you know. Uh, was this something you had been thinking about, something you've been writing about for a long time? Had you always wanted to continue those storylines? Yeah, the, the thing was, I mean, even after The Key, I was still, you know, singing and playing drums. And the record company, Earache, was like, you know, you guys are, you got a drummer that has this huge drum set. He's behind the drums singing and you can't see him, you know, at all because the drums are so big. <clears throat> and then the guitar players didn't move around a lot and the keyboard player was stuck behind the keyboards so they said you know you guys this show is kind of boring without a front man so earache told us when we did thresholds uh or actually you know i should say before we started recording thresholds they said you either need to quit playing drums and become the front man or get a front man huh. and the, and we were like well at first it was like I don't want to do that, you know. Uh, yeah. I had all these ideas for continuing the key, and and um, and they were like, "Well, if you don't do that, we're going to cut your budget." And uh, you know, like, like um, um, MTV's Headbangers Ball was new too, mm -hmm. and everybody was doing videos back then, you know, in in ninety one, ninety two, and that's when death metal started getting actual real song videos on on, on TV. So, you know, and Eric was like, we're not going to do a video, you know, with you behind the drums and this and that. So <laughs> everybody, you know, we've always been, I've always tried to do my bands in a democratic way with, with, with uh, voting on things, you know, like I want everybody to be happy in the band. So, you know, everybody was like, well, let's get a singer. And, you know, and I didn't really want to quit playing drums and sing because that's not me. You know, I don't, yeah. I wouldn't know what to do as a front man. It's kind of, you know, by myself, I'm just... I'm more of a drummer than a singer. So I thought, well, 
you know, let's try some vocalists out and see what happens. And we found somebody for thresholds. Uh, but what happened was then everybody in the band wanted to start writing lyrics at that point. Because before that, you know, in the early Nocturnus, I was writing the lyrics. And then Mike Davis, when he came into the band, he had some good sci-fi ideas, you know. And uh, so we decided, you know, to start put, he'd give me like four or five lines and maybe a so song title. And then I would just, you know, fill everything in and finish it. Right. So when Paradox, I mean, when Thresholds came about, you know, everybody wanted to write lyrics. So the whole album changed lyrically than what we had started working on. Because if you look uh, there on YouTube, there's a couple practice videos from like say 1991, early 92, yeah, uh, in a in a warehouse, and I'm still singing some of these songs that were on Thresholds when you know before Thresholds came out. Yeah. So as you can see, you know, the history will show that I was going to sing on Thresholds, and everything was going to be the same as the key, just you know new stuff and uh so we ended up getting you know and then the record company kind of threatened us you know with that stuff and getting the front man thing and and so we ended up getting a front man and then he wanted to write lyrics and you know the keyboard player wanted to write lyrics and mike liked writing lyrics and you know i only ended up writing like lyrics to two songs oh wow yeah on, on uh on thresholds so everything that i had planned to continue the key story there's not one thing on thresholds that goes back to the key. Not even one song connects back right. to the key. And that's not what I wanted. You know, even the cover wouldn't have been, you know, we had, uh, you know, the guy, the Android guy on, on the cover of the key, of course, and he wasn't on thresholds at all. You know, so everything I had planned to do just fell apart. Gotcha. And so I was not happy, you know, and uh, that's why, the things ended up happening the way they did with me, you know, then they stole the name from me because they realized that I never trademarked the name, but I didn't think I needed to trademark the name because we were signed, you know, to a label under Nocturnus. Mm -hmm. So and back then there was a lot of record uh, stores and, you know, Earache had, you could go to any record store and find our record. So I was like, nobody's going to steal Nocturnus. They can't, you know, we have product out. And that's the way I thought things went, but I never thought somebody in the band would go behind my back and trademark the name and then, you know, kind of like get everybody on their side to make things bigger. They wanted to be the next Dream Theater because oh. Dream Theater was getting really popular back in the early 90s. And they're like, dude, if we do this and go more all sci-fi and get rid of all the evil stuff and this and that, and, you know, we could be huge, you know, and I'm like, but that's not what people like us for right you know i don't want to change our style that much and change you know what we write about and everything and uh but it happened that way and of course thresholds sold about a third of what the key did yeah mm -hmm. somehow the label blamed us for that <laughs> you know <laughs> and then uh so they thought it was my fault for some reason everybody in the band you know went against me because i kept fighting let's go back and, you know, try to fix this. And they're like, no, no, it's, it's going to work. We just got to give it more time. And so before I knew it, you know, we went on a tour with Confessor in Europe. And when we got back, everybody was like, you know, we had a meeting, band meeting. And they were like, well, you know, we own the name now. We talked to Earache. Uh, we're going to let you go. And I had already talked to Vince in Asheron because, you know, he was the first guitar player in Nocturnus. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. In the first demo. So I'd already talked to Vince about doing the next drums on the next Asher on that record because he asked me if I wanted to do, you know, drums on the second Asher on record. And I was like, sure, you know, I, you know, I, me and Vince get along great. So I thought, okay, you know, I can do that and still, you know, stay in Nocturnus. But then they were like, they kind of used that too. Well, you know, we know you're going to do drums and Asher on. So I figured, you know, it'd be better if you went for a satanic band like that. And we don't want to have this imagery anymore. Of, and, you know, we want to try to step up and sell records, you know, like, like you know, Dream Theater. Yeah. So I was like, well, okay, what I, I, you know, I was like, everything was falling apart. And I saw it happening. And, uh, you know, people were doing interviews with me when we were out on the road for Thresholds. 
and they didn't want to do interviews with the singer. You won't find one interview with the singer, the new singer. And uh, they were still, and people were asking me like, why did you quit singing, you know, right in front of the new singer? Oh, wow. And that caused even more turmoil, you know? Yeah. I didn't know what to say when somebody asked me a question like that. I'm like, what do I say? You know? And uh, I basically said the truth. You know, it's not something I wanted to do, but you know, the label, you know, said this. And then, uh, so when they said you're out of the band and we own the name now, I'm like, what do you mean you own the name and lose like, yeah, I trademarked the name. It's mine now. And, uh, you know, I was a kid still back then and I, I didn't have money for a lawyer to sue them and try to get the name back. And I knew I was going to do Asher on. And I kind of figured what happened with thresholds was already kind of, you know, changed the whole situation of the band. So, you know, even back then, I wanted to continue the key story, Hmm. but I never did. And when I started After Death, I thought, you know, I don't, I really don't want to do that with After Death because it's not Nocturnus. Right. You know, so we, we did music that wasn't that much different, but none of the stuff linked back to Nocturnus, you know, yeah. lyrically wise. Um, it was more kind of just straight up occult stuff in After Death, which was, you know, great. Yeah, but we fantastic to stuff. Take After Death to places we really couldn't do anything if we were trying to be like another Nocturnus, you know. But then a lot of people just kept asking me, you know, why don't you do Nocturnus again since they broke up again? You know, because after they fired me, they only lasted like six months. Yeah, they and didn't then, stick around. <laughs> they really dropped them. They recorded those two songs that ended up on Moribun. And uh, the weird thing with that was it was uh, Mummified and uh, Possess the Priest that were the two songs on that. And Possess the Priest was a song that me and Vince and Bateman wrote. Oh. So they kicked me out of the band. Then they steal a song that they had nothing to do with. And, you know, tried to use it for the next demo to show Eric what was going to be on the third album without me. Then I found out, well, we didn't have the internet back then. You know, so I actually talked to Eric and they were like, we had no idea they had fired you until they told us. Uh-huh. And, you know, everyone in the band told me that they had Eric's permission, which was a lie. So Eric was like, you guys better when you get a new drummer, you know, show some, you know, do a little demo and see what the new stuff sounds like with the new drummer and all that. And, and uh, so they did that, and then Eric dropped them. Wow. So that's why uh, those uh, Mama Fight and that other uh, Possessive Priest came out on its own little EP, I guess they called it, or whatever, but it was only two songs. But uh, then they split up. Yeah. So um, one thing I've always, I've always wanted to ask you about this was uh, – you know, kind of growing up where you, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you, you must've been an avid science fiction reader. You, I mean, one, the one thing that's so cool about the key and, and of course that continuation now with, uh, you know, with, with paradox and, and whatever's to come from that as well is there was nothing like that at all. Um, you know, it was really, I mean, the key was really a revolutionary album in terms of death metal. I mean, you know, most death metal and there, you know, they're, lots of great talented bands of that at that time of course but you know everything was fairly straightforward kind of a cult you know you know or or death and war and violence whereas you had these really complicated interesting storylines with very complicated and interesting music as well and incorporated keyboards which had never been done i'm sure you know and yeah i'm sure you know you know as you know death metal at that time like every like you know, no way keyboards, hell no. But I mean, in in a lot of ways, I think Nocturnus, you specifically, Mike, and, uh, you know, and Chuck from Death, I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, later Death music, you guys invented progressive death metal. I mean, you really created this new kind of sub-genre of music. And, And did you have a sense of how revolutionary what you were doing at the time really was? You know, it's weird when you're writing, you don't really... I mean, me at least, we've always, in every band I've been in, uh, pretty much, we've always written the music and then went back and fit the lyrics in. Hmm. And and uh, so I kind of never thought about things that way. We would always just write the songs. And then uh, actually I had to give a lot of credit to Davis because Mike Davis, because he 
you know, it's like, let's put some science fiction into this. And I grew up in the 70s. I'm 57 years old. So, you know, back in the 70s, didn't have the internet. You didn't have cable even, right. you know. And, and so I always watched horror movies and sci-fi movies. And being a, a kid in the 70s, you know, horror toys were, were you know, and sci-fi toys. I always collected the, like the Mego figures and Planet of the Apes and, you know, sci-fi stuff. I always like spaceships. And every kid in the 60s and early 70s wanted to be an astronaut. Yeah. yeah. Back then, that was the big thing. You know, now it's kind of different, of course. But back then, you know, that was the future. And I always loved that stuff. And, uh, and I always liked the old, you know, movies like, like well, of course, Andromeda Strain, things like that, you know. And, uh, and, and Mike loved that stuff, too. So we got together and started talking about, you know, taking the band lyrically a little different. Because on the first Nocturnus demo, I was still pretty much into the, you know, more of an angel satanic kind of thing and right. writing things in that era. And uh, <clears throat> when Mike said, let's do some sci-fi, I got a couple ideas and I'm like, okay, sure. You know, and luckily I knew exactly what he was talking about because, you know, we both liked the same things. And uh, like he came up with the Neolithic idea. Oh, okay. You know, and he gave me like six or seven lines of, of stuff, you know, and you know, like he loved Transformers. So he, you know, kind of came up with some lyrics that kind of came from Transformer ideas and he would give them to me and then I'd put the whole thing together. So it, it kind of, that's the way it came about. And luckily I was, you know, I used to read a lot because, you know, there was nothing else to do really, but watch a cup, like there was like five channels on TV. Right. <laughs> so there was nothing on, you know, and I didn't hang around a bunch of kids. I wasn't into sports or anything like that. So a lot of times I was just at home reading sci-fi books, cool, you know, things like that. And I really liked science fiction, you know, and the, you know, Asimov and Pornell, Jerry Pornell and, you know, Larry Niven, things like that, you know, those kind of authors. And uh, so I was very versed in that stuff. And when Mike said, let's do this, I was like, sure, you know, this is a you know good thing. So we kind of both put that together in lyric wise and it kind of changed uh, from the first Nocturnus demo to the second Nocturnus demo to having some of that. And that's why we came up with the science of horror. You know, we, the science fiction and the horror, we kind of mixed together. And because that had kind of never been done. Yeah. You know, in the music. And I, and I think a lot of it, some of it came from a book uh, that, as a matter of fact, Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell wrote a book. Um, it was... Um, Oh shoot! Now I'm trying to remember. That. Uh, it was uh, in Inferno, was it? I think it was. It was no, it was Dante. Well, it was Dante's Inferno. Oh, okay. But it was just called Inferno, and it was a sci-fi version of Dante's Inferno. Cool. It's a really cool book. And I used to love that book. And and uh, so I kind of was like, this is a great thing, you know. They mixed like really crazy Dante's Inferno stuff with the sci-fi together and came up with this very strange sci-fi hell, almost like what Hellraiser was, but way before that. Right. You know, and uh, so I always liked that book. That was one of my favorite books when I was, when I was a kid. And, and I was like, you know, I want to write stuff like this too. You know, I didn't copy that by any means in any of the songs. We have nothing like that, but the idea was there, you know, and, and uh, I was just like, yeah, let's, let's kind of push things this way, lyrically. Yeah. And when I started writing, um, like, we realized that Andromeda Strain and um, Droid Sector and Destroying the Manger and Empire of the Sands, well, those three first uh, kind of fit as a story. So I kind of rearranged some of the lyrics and kind of made a story out of it. And then when we did the last song, Empire of the Sands, I really made it gel as a story and finish it off. And then if you notice, Empire of the Sands fades out. And my idea was to fade back in with mm -hmm. that last rhythm of Empire of the Sands on thresholds and, you know, continue the story. But that never happened. So for a long time, I really wanted to do that. 
you know, and, and so finally it came to the point where so many people kept asking me, well, you know, Nocturnus hasn't done anything since, you know, 2000 and they put out ethereal tombs and that really bombed in sales. I think, you know, it sold like 3000 or something, you know, back then <laughs> and then they never went any farther and broke up again. So I thought, you know, after a while I started seeing bands add AD or BC to their name with former members and it was fine. They didn't get in trouble for it. So I thought, well, I already have BCAD. Right. And this is a new version. So I thought Nocturnus AD would be perfect and they can't do anything to me legally anymore if I do that. So I talked to everybody in the band and, and um, with After Death, uh, when we wrote songs, they were in D. Uh, but everything on the key and thresholds was a E flat written in E flat. So I told everybody in the band, I said, you know, we're going to have to, I want to change back to E flat tuning for Nocturnus AD. And when we do after death, it'll be D. And they're like, well, you know, we'll have to separate the two because we can't really bring so many guitars on tour and different tunes and stuff like that. And, right. you know, we weren't that big of a boom to where we had roadies and, you know, 10 guitars each, you know, on yeah. tour. Some of these bands you see, they got like this huge case of like five guitars or 10 guitars in it. You know, we were never that big of a band to be able to, you know, pay roadies and do all that stuff. So I said, well, let's make a distinction, a big distinction between After Death and Nocturnus AD. So, and I said, you know, let's continue the key story because that's the big thing I always wanted to do. I always had a lot of ideas, but I never penned them down. They were just up here, you know, my brain. So, you know, when everybody was like, okay, we'll try it. Because we had played, and after death, we played those Nocturna songs all the time. So I thought, you know, we were comfortable with the Nocturna songs, being able to play them. And uh, so since we played them so many times live, we knew the difference between what we were writing in after death and the old Nocturna songs that we were playing live definitely had a difference. But we kind of, knew the two different styles because we played them so much. And I said, well, we're going to have to go into E flat and then continue all the stuff that I wanted to continue before. And everybody was like, cool. You know, it sounds good to me. So, and I said, then we'll have two bands and we can do whatever we want. So we did that. And, you know, we wrote paradox and we put out, well, we, we recorded like six songs, six of the, I think we had eight songs at that point. And we recorded six of them just ourselves in our practice room. And we released just one song, you know, as a demo. And dude, we got like a whole bunch of labels writing us. You know, we want to sign you guys. We want to sign you guys. We want to sign you guys. This is awesome. And I was like, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I was like, this is a good thing, of course. But, you know, so we did. And we went with them. Well, I started telling the labels. I said, look, you know, we need a good budget because I want this to sound good you know it's got to go back to that sound that the key had yeah. and we can't do that on two thousand dollars you know and a lot of bands record themselves and we could have done our own recording and released it and it would have sounded good but i said you know i told every label that wrote us i said we need a good budget and i want a one song video and right there about 80 percent of the labels said well we can't afford to give you you know a couple thousand dollars for a video and you know a seven or eight thousand dollar recording budget you know we just right. can't afford them i said well if you can't afford that what are you going to do when our album comes out you can't afford you know ads that are like you know a back cover on a magazine yeah. so like decibel or something's expensive so i said i don't want to be stuck in with 50 other bands on a, a full page ad you know and we're like our album's down there in the bottom like this big yeah and so out of all the labels, pretty much Profound Lore was the one that was like, he loved all our ideas, you know, the things I wanted to do. And he said, yeah, you know, we can do this, we can do that. And then we ended up playing Australia. And, and I talked to, you know, the main guy from Portal and they were on, you know, Profound Lore. And he told me, he goes, dude, we've got, every label wants to sign Portal right now. You know, this is a couple, you know, a couple of years ago. And uh, he said, but we're on, profound lore 
because I asked him how the label was. And he said, uh, you know, he goes, I've got so many other offers, but Profound Lore has been so good to us because I've turned everything down and stayed with them. So I said, yeah, they're asking us now. And he goes, well, you know, if you want a good label, that's the one, you know. So we signed the, the deal with them and they did everything they said they were going to do, even more. You know, they just actually, even now, uh, about a month and a half ago, they hooked up with a, a distributor in Brazil for like 400 copies of cool. Paradox. Nice. So, you know, they're still working on doing things for Paradox. Very and cool. uh, and it was a, it's not a big, super long, you know, 20 page contract with five albums or something. It was a small contract for a couple albums. And it was like, it was the perfect thing. You know, they were wanted to do a video. They wanted to let us do whatever we wanted, you know, music wise, artwork wise. And, you know, I talked to the owner of the label, Chris, for like two hours on the phone the first time we talked and he was a big fan of the old Nocturna stuff. So I thought, you know, even though it's a small, Profound Lore is not a big label, they still do really good. Yeah. And um, after talking to him personally, it was just like, you know, he understood everything that I wanted to do and was like, yeah, man, this all sounds great. Let's do it. So we signed the label, you know, with them. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's been a really good situation and he hasn't bugged us as like, you got to get this second album out by, you know, like December 30th or something, you know, right. He's, we're going to do it and it's going to sound good because we're taking our time, but you know, only practicing once a week, you miss one practice and then you've only practiced three times in a month. Right. You know, yes. so it's kind of hard. And, and the way we've been writing lately, um, the way we wrote most of paradox was I had the two guitar players and me in there and we would just like, I'd, we wrote everything in the rehearsal room. So not, no, nobody came in with like the full song completely written and said, here it is. Oh, okay. We built every song between me and the two guitar players right there in, in the practice room. Like I'd say, like, all right, throw out a rhythm. So we'd kind of learn it, make a couple little changes to it or whatever. And then I'd look at the other guitar player. Okay, now you throw out a rhythm and let's fit those two together. So the songs were all built that way. Wow. So very organic, very collaborative. Right. Right. Very and cool. I, you know, Cause so many albums are written by one person and, you know, like, like say even Morbid Angel, Trey has a drum machine and he writes everything. Right. And then the drummers learn the parts that he wrote on a drum machine. And a lot of albums are done that way actually now, um, especially with Pro Tools and, you know, click mm -hmm. tracks and all that. And I've never used a click track. So I wanted you know, Paradox to sound just as organic as the key did. And, you know, and it ended up being a really good situation because it ended up being that way. You yeah, know? definitely. That's a, it's a phenomenal album. What I love about it too is that it, I mean, one, you're continuing these storylines, but it doesn't sound like it's this nostalgic project. It's a continuation. That's what I love. It's, it's very fresh. It's, um, I mean, it has, you know, definitely modern production, but it, it feels like that you know like the key but without being like oh you know we're, we're going to try to relive our past it's right no it's like this is a continuation um i mean yeah it's 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 fantastic but i love to before i even listened to the album when i saw when i bought it you know way back when when it came out when i saw the you know the first track seizing the throne i'm like that's right Mike's fucking seizing the throne. He's back. <laughs> He's taking this back over. I love it. Um, and I don't know if that's what you meant, but for me, that was like the first, I hadn't, having not even heard the song, that was the first thing that popped in my head was like, yep, Mike, Mike is seizing the throne. I love this. Um, yeah, and that, that was the idea. I mean, we didn't want to write the key part too exactly, you know, like yeah. music wise, you know, like we didn't want to rehash those same ideas and make it sound exactly like, you know, the, that album. Yeah. We definitely wanted to make it different, but we didn't want it to sound like after death either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but lyrically is the, the main part of it that kind of continues. Yeah. Um, music wise, it's a little, it's definitely different from the key. Yeah. Definitely. You know, more modern sounding, but also um, Jarrett Pritchard, who, who engineered and produced the record has been a friend of mine for years since the early nineties. And he, he, li he lives in Tampa or used to live in Tampa, I should say. 
and I lived in an apartment complex and he lived in the same building as I did just upstairs oh. and uh, like across from me. So every time I'd leave my apartment, you know, I could see his front door and they had eulogy, a band called eulogy back then. He was a guitar player for eulogy, really good death metal band for back then. Yeah. And, um, uh, he went to school for, for, you know, went, you know, learned music and stuff like that. And then he became a sound man and, you know, did bands like 1349, Goat Horror. Now he's working for Celtic Frost and Trypticon and all that. And I mean, he's doing really good stuff. And he became an amazing, you know, not just sound man, but, but engineer as well. So I started, and then I found out that he had that studio in Orlando and he had just bought a a reel to reel 24 track reel to reel machine from oh. California and shipped it over you know to Orlando and he was just setting it up and stuff and uh, I think we were like the second band to use it uh, that he recorded and so when we you know I told him you know I'd like to use the the two inch reel to reel to record and he came up with the idea he's like well you know it's got to end up in Pro Tools no matter what these days but he said what we can do is record all the drums analog with the two inch reel to reel transfer those into pro tools and then add everything else in from there and i said yeah you know he said that way it'll give it at least you know the the beef of the album this kind of like old school you know uh, audio sound rather than digital sound yeah and you know we even though our guitar players um do have uh Kemper heads. Um, everybody's got Kempers now, the bass player and the two guitar players. And that's all digital stuff, but we didn't use all of that. Kind of like we used different amps and set them up and they recorded. And then what you can do with a Kemper is once they had this particular sound that they liked with two or three different amps all hooked together and the Jarrett kind of hooked up for us because he was very familiar with Nocturnus. And it, he's seen us live a bunch of times in Tampa. So he knew what we wanted. And he's like, I'm going to get you the guitar sound, but it's not going to be through your Kempers. So, you know, we were open to that, of course. So we did that. And then what happened after that was once we had this sound and it was recorded, we were able to take that sound and put that into the Kemper. Cool. So now when they use their Kempers live, they have the exact same sound that was on the album. That's cool. Yeah. So everything worked out pretty good that way. And and so we kind of mixed old school with new school, you know, and, and uh, it worked out quite well. And and the thing was, we did a, the recording on the weekends. We I think of four or five weekends. We went there like Saturday and Sunday and recorded all the all the tracks. And then um, what happened was it ended up in like October of that year, uh, 2019, I believe it was. And uh he had to go on tour with Goat Whore. And then he had another small tour with, I think it was 1349 after that. So we had to take a small break between recording and mixing. Mm. It was really a good thing because we got about two months to listen to all the raw recordings. And, uh, you know, then he started mixing the record when he got back. I think uh, it was in late December. And so he would send us, he would do some mixing and send it to us and things like that. And, you know, uh, let's turn this up, let's turn this down. And, you know, so we actually had time to work on the album over months. And uh, that I think had a lot to do with it too, because some bands, you know, they, they book a week in the studio or two weeks in the studio or whatever it is. And it's straight time. Yeah. You got to finish all that you have in that week or, you know, say they book five days or seven days and, you have to do all your recording and mixing in that week. Yeah. So if there's anything you want to change and you go back later and go, Ooh, I wish I would have done this or that. We actually had the ability to do that and go, okay, we didn't really re-record anything. Um, but we were able to, you know, when it came to mixing you know, get exactly the kind of sound that we all were happy with. Right. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Because you get to actually sit back and think about it more and go, okay, yeah, we know oh, this time we need to bring the guitars up or whatever, you know. Yeah. Right. There's also the point of, you know, 
mixing too much you know yeah you get so used to these songs because you hear them so many times when you're recording them and mixing them and you know going back and listening to them each time somebody puts a track down uh that you kind of don't really have the same you know sound that you think you have because you're so used to hearing it now right so it was a really good thing because there was a point where i put it away for like two weeks and then came back and listened to it it was like oh wait a minute, this has got to change. This has got to be louder. And this has got, you know, so it was a really good thing the way we got to record over time like that. And I think it, it really contributed to the sound that we got, we're able to get, to get back to the key sound. Nice. Very cool. Uh, so Mike, I wanted to ask you about uh, kind of, let's, let's go back in time. Um, how did you originally get started in music and drumming? I have a time machine for that, you know. Pardon? I have a time machine for that. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, yes, you do. Yeah. So it's, uh, this guy, this guy helps you out, I believe. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, how did, how, so yeah. How did you get started in music? How did you, when did you start drumming? Well, the funny thing is, is back in the seventies, my mom had a band. Oh, cool. Yeah, it, it wasn't a big band. It was just like a, they did covers, you know, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Janis Joplin, things like that, because it was early 70s. And I think I was about 10 or 11. And uh, they used to practice in the back room of my mom's house before they went out and started playing, you know, small bars and clubs in Tampa. And they only did, they never did any uh, originals or anything. They just did instrumental stuff. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, cover tunes. But I used to watch them play. And for some reason, I always liked to watch the drums. Hmm. So when I got into uh, like sixth and seventh grade and we started having like a, a real school band thing and you had to choose an instrument right away, I was like, oh, I want to play drums, you know? So that's kind of how that started. Um, and my mom was always, uh, you know, she never was against it because she really couldn't be because she even did her own band. Right. You know, so it's kind of funny, and it was called Foxy with like two X's, F O X X Y. <laughs> nice. You know, and they had a, it was the traditional '70s band, like you know the you know the bass player that just kind of sits back and plays with the big beard and stuff, and you right. know, yeah. traditional bass player, and you know the guitar player looked like the guy that Creedence Clearwater Revival, and the drummer was like almost like a country type drummer, but they did you know regular rock songs from then. So you know, I watched her practice back there, their band. and uh, you know kind of it kind of set a thing in me that I wanted to do that too nice so that's how I kind of started playing drums and then when it came to school I took you know band in school and I took it all the way like through 10th grade um marching band things like that but like for 11th and 12th I couldn't take band because we had to the marching band practiced two hours after school every day. Oh. And my family, you know, it was just me and my mom. Uh, so we weren't rich or anything. And, you know, it was like, if I wanted a car, I had to work. <clears throat> uh, so it was like, I got jobs at 16. I started working and I've always worked my whole life to get the things that I have. Cause I just didn't get them handed to me. Like, you know, a lot of kids were lucky and got that. Yeah. You know, like, some kids in my high school was was uh, kind of like a lot of rich kids. Even though I wasn't rich, there was a lot of rich kids. In, and they had, you know, brand new cars and things like that. And I always ended up having to do my own thing. You know, like yeah. if I wanted to phone, I had to buy it. So I couldn't practice five days a week, two hours a day, you know, learning halftime shows for the football team. Yeah. And But, you know, when I was in there uh, for 10th grade before I really started working, uh, we did like halftime shows for the Bucks. We did two halftime shows for the Bucks. We did a halftime show for the Miami Dolphins. Oh, wow. which is kind of cool. Yeah, we actually took buses, the whole band, down there to Miami and uh, played played that show. And it's funny, uh, but if you look back in Plant uh, in 1980, 81, um, there's a, on YouTube. There's a couple uh, videos. Oh. Uh, wow. The plant high school band halftime shows up on youtube and i'm in them cool i mean you can see me because it's from way up top but i'm down there you nice. know and those 50 people down there playing 
So, which was kind of cool. I mean, I was playing, you know, I played in a stadium, the Tampa stadium and the Miami stadium when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old. That's really cool. You know, which was kind of cool. So it, it, it helped me a lot, but then uh, I wanted to play in the jazz band too, cause that was drum set. But the teacher was like, once I quit playing in the marching band, he wouldn't let me play in the jazz band unless you were in the marching band. Yeah. And I remember he told my mom, you know, my mom got really mad and went down to the school and had a talk with him. And he was kind of a mean music teacher, you know, very stern and stuff like that. And he's like, well, he quit to do a job. So, you know, he's never going to become anything in music. <laughs> he told my mom that. And I was just like, wow, you know, and uh, just kind of funny because out of everybody, I still talked to several people that were in that the high school band. And a couple of them have have had bands like small bands that do local stuff, but it's funny. But out of that whole band, I'm like the only one. Yeah, that yeah. actually went anywhere. Yeah, you toured the world. You're, you, you have. Yeah. You know, so okay, teacher. Yeah, I guess yeah. you were right. I was never going to do anything. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not. I I've never thought of myself as like an amazing drummer. I I've, I've always looked at drums as trying to be original as possible. And do what other people kind of weren't doing hmm. instead of doing everything that everybody else was doing, but trying to beat the next person in speed or, you know, right. timing, technicality and things like that. So, you know, I, I always looked at drumming a little differently and, you know, my, my biggest drummers were like Bonham from Zeppelin and, you know, and Tommy Aldridge and Ozzy. Oh yeah. Was I was amazing. I was going to ask who, who your influences were as, as far as probably, being I think the person that that Tommy Aldridge was probably one of my biggest influences because of it's things amazing. he kind of brought double bass almost into, you know, like into fruition and in music because bands use double bass, but they didn't use it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And when Ozzy came out and especially when he put out like that, that the bat's head record, you know, that's live doing Sabbath songs. Tommy Aldridge was playing double bass to Sabbath songs. And I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. So uh, that happened. And then I, I remember getting um, Angel Witch's first album. Oh, such a great album. Yeah. And even before that, I got something that uh, called Metal for Mothers. Oh, yeah. Have you ever seen those yeah. compilations? And they had a song called Baphomet on there. And it was just, when I heard that song, I was like, this is what I want to do. This is it right here. You know, and I was still in high school and I heard that song and I was just like, this is the kind of stuff I want to do. That was kind of the catalyst for you. Was that, that's cool. So if you go back and listen to that song, Baphomet. Um, yeah, great song. I, I love Angel versions, they did, they, Yeah, They did two versions of that song. One was on the metal for mothers. And then there was another one that was just on their demos. Yeah. And I think one of the versions is like eight minutes long and it's fantastic. Yeah, you know, I think that's it, the one I have. I think I don't, I don't, as I don't have the mothers, I don't have metal for mothers. I've always been, I've been trying to find, I would love to get that on vinyl and, and I'm a I, massive new wave of British it. heavy metal fan. Oh, you do. Oh, sweet. Yeah, <laughs> Very yeah, cool. And it's the original one that I had back then. I oh, still nice. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hang yeah. on to that. That thing's rare. Um, oh, I know. It's probably pretty scratched up. You know, I haven't listened to it in a long time. Right. I do still have it. And, you know, back then, that's how I used to practice. You know, I literally had my drum set in that same back room where my mom's band used to practice. And I had a, you know, back then, everybody had these huge home stereos. You know, the Marantz and, you know, oh, the tuner, yeah. the premier tuner, the big, yeah, the, all the separate components. And you had these huge, you know, big home speakers. So I used to literally put a speaker here, a speaker here. And then I had the turntable right behind me because there was no CDs, no cassettes even at that point. And you either had an eight track or, or a vinyl. Yeah. So I used to literally have the, the, the turntable right behind me and I used to like drop the needle and then just start playing, you know, to, to records. Cool. And I, another record too that I had, I remember um, I had bought this um and I really didn't listen to a lot of Jeff Beck, but I saw this Jeff Beck album with Jan Hammer. 
Mm. And it was like a three piece. It was Jeff Beck, Jan Hammer and a bass player. I forgot who was the bass player on that, but I bought that and it was all, you know, guitar, keyboards and drums. There was no bass on it. And I used to jam to that a lot. And there was some really cool keyboard stuff. So I think, you know, for me growing up, a lot of the bands I listened to, Deep Purple, you know, even Angel Witch used some keyboards here yeah, and there. Yeah. And, you know, listening to that stuff, I just I was so used to hearing keyboards. Zeppelin used a lot of keyboards and their bass players split split the duties of doing that. But they had, you know, when I heard Cashmere, I was oh, like, yeah. Ooh, this is the song. You know, that's still one of my favorite songs. And, you know, it had that Middle Eastern feel and had all the keyboards in it and the, the huge drum sound. And I was just like, you know, I want to take this and put that into metal because back then everything was metal. Yeah. There wasn't death metal. There wasn't black metal. There wasn't doom metal. There wasn't technical metal. It was metal. Yeah. And either you listened to metal or you didn't. Right. And, you know, I mean, everybody was lumped in together. So I think back then, you know, you had Nasty Savage was probably, and, and of course, Avatar and Sabotage, same thing. You know, they were the starters of it around here. And there was another band called Argus too, but they, they didn't really uh, do many originals. They did an EP, but they used to play Angel Witch and stuff like that live. Oh, cool. Yeah. And you yeah, actually and, play in Argus now, right? Well, I did. They're, okay. they're broken now. Oh. Okay. Uh, Cause those guys were even older than me. Right. And, um, you know, their singer was great. He had a fantastic voice. He could do Priest, ACDC, everything like that, you know, and Scorpions, any of that stuff he could sing perfectly. We even did, you know, like Metal Church. Oh, yeah. You know, he could sing Metal Church. I mean, he had a fantastic voice. Um, of course, when he got into his almost 60 years old, he kind of blew his voice out once. And it was never the same after that. Mm. and the band kind of one of the guitar players started having some health problems and it just kind of fell apart the the funny thing was uh when they kind of got back together the only person that didn't live in the area anymore was the drummer oh okay so they needed a drummer and i used to go watch them when i was a kid like 18 19 years old so you know i, I i'd always talk to one of the guitar players and you know i was like hey i'll do it for you so <clears throat> for a couple of years I did not. I did. Uh, I did Argus for about four years. Oh, okay, cool. In the two thousands, and uh, you know they had a Black Sabbath tribute that was like fifteen minutes long. Nice. And, and like twenty different songs, little parts from, and it all just flowed. And I used to love doing that, things like that. So they did a lot of Black Sabbath, uh, none of the Dio stuff, but all the old stuff. Gotcha. And, cool. you know, it was just fun playing those songs. <laughs> I never was in a, any cover bands, hardly ever doing stuff like that, you know. So I thought this would be fun to do, you know. So when I joined Argus, I had, a, you know, a lot of fun. We played a lot of shows and uh, got to do songs that I've always liked and never thought I would play covers, you know. But since I knew all those guys and I joined the band, it was it worked out pretty well. And then it, the thing kind of fell apart because of, like I said, different situations with them. And then they got a different singer and their drummer moved back into town, their mm. original. drummer. Uh, so they got back together, but it only lasted about maybe six months and it kind of fell apart again. Okay. So unfortunately, you know, I mean, I'm still friends with all the guys, but it was, a, it was a great time. They're a good party band that does, yeah the type of metal that most bands don't do you know like like cover songs wise right right yeah yeah it's, i'd always i remember reading about them years and years and years ago and i know like uh you know like i've talked to dave austin of nasty savage and he was you know he talked about them and how much he loved them you know this, you know argus was always a big influence for him too i think you know or just you know hung out with those guys and really enjoyed their music yeah, they were the only band that did all metal type stuff um and heavy rock but they were the only band that put stuff like angel witch and storm child and bands you know yeah. like, stuff like that in their set and metal church things like that and you know it just didn't nobody did that you know right. they all stuck to the rock and roll covers and you know things like that 
So it was, it was really good. You know, I was just like, yeah, let's do this, you know? And it was fun. So when, uh, you know, so we talked about, you know, you were in high school. So I would assume it was probably shortly after that, um, that you joined and you were, you know, the original drummer of Morbid Angel. I don't know. Some people may not know that, but you're on that first album, which was released years later, I think, you know, several years after you had left the band and when you were in Nocturnus, actually. Um, so kind of how did you get involved with Morbid Angel uh, originally? Did you, did you grow up with those guys? Did you, you know, the original members? Well, I met Trey in high school. Okay. So, you know, I wasn't in the school band anymore, but I still, you know, I just got my first drum set and uh, I had been in the same high school for, you know, the whole time. And Trey came into high school when I was in my last year of high school, 12th grade. And he came in in 11th grade. He moved from another part of Tampa in, to where I live, South Tampa, it's called. And so he started going to plant, but he was a new student, you know. And uh, we had a place in plant called The Alley where everybody that was like partiers kind of like hung out on the side of the school. And, you know, back then everybody smoked cigarettes there right on the school property and they let them. Right. You know? these kids are 16 you know 15 16 <laughs> cigarettes you know i never smoked cigarettes but trey did you know but i always used to hang out in the alley because everybody you know smoked joints back there right <laughs> you're talking 1979 80 yeah yeah and so um i met trey then and we started talking about music and he's like oh, you like this and you like this i'm like yeah yeah and he's like oh, i just got my first guitar and uh, you know i want to do a band and I was like, okay, you know, let's jam together. So we did, and it was called Ice. Hmm. And it was just Trey and I, and there was another guitar player and another bass player that were also, and a singer. We had a singer. Um, and we used to do like Scorpions and things like that. And we actually played the the high school talent show. It was our first show. Oh, wow. Cool. And it, it went over really well. So you know, we had this band going and, and, uh, <clears throat> and we both liked the Necronomicon too. It was funny because he had a Necronomicon and I had a Necronomicon and nobody else in that whole high school knew what that was. So it was just kind of destined for us to meet in high school back then and, and do this. And so we had that band ice for a while. And then when I graduated, Trey moved again to like the north end of Tampa, which was back then seemed like a long ways away. And we kind of like lost contact there. And that's when he met Dallas, uh, the original first bass player in Morbid Angel. Um, and they had a drummer that was a little older than them. <clears throat> and uh, he wasn't kind of getting what they wanted to do because they Trey wanted to do at that point, all originals. And they had a singer that kind of sounded like the singer from Cyrus Ungle. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this weird raspy kind of voice. And it was, uh, his name was Charles. They had Charles and Trey and Dallas and this other drummer. And I remember I saw Trey at a show. I might've been an Argus show. And, uh, and he was telling me, you know, yeah, we got this drummer and he doesn't live in Tampa and he drives every weekend and he's older than us. And he's just not understanding what we're wanting to do. And they were called Death Watch. So Trey said, you want to start playing again with me? And I was like, sure. You know, so I joined again. And then uh, the singer ended up getting busted for dealing coke and got like 10 years because it was a big thing. Oh, wow. You know, and so that kind of fell apart. And then uh, we didn't have a singer for a while. We just did instrumental stuff as a three piece, me and Trey in Dallas. And uh, we decided to change the when Charles got arrested, we changed the name to Heretic. Then we found out there was a Heretic in California that already had an album out. Mm. So we changed the name then to Morbid Angel. And at first we were just a three piece instrumental. Huh. We used to do, you know, parties and, you know, things like that, you know, and uh, we started trying out singers and that's when Merciful Fate was starting to get really popular. And we love Merciful Fate, yeah. all of them. And, and um, so we started looking for a singer that could sing like King Diamond. And we tried out a few different people and nobody really 
was getting, it sound, didn't sound right. And I remember we had this guy, Kenny, who, who, uh, who tried out for us. He was older than us, but he had a whole PA and light show and everything. And uh, we went in and recorded some, a couple songs, and that's called The Beginning. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's, I've uh, heard of it. I've never heard it. No, it's, it's on YouTube. You can find it. Oh, okay, cool. So he, so he ended up, and he paid for the studio time. So we went in the studio and recorded a couple songs with him on vocals, and it just didn't sound right. He had a terrible falsetto. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, he told us he could sing like King Diamond, but, and he didn't sound bad live, but for some reason in the studio, we listened to it. And Dallas, uh, the bass player, was singing the backups. And before he did, uh, before Kenny did the vocals, Dallas did all the songs. He sang them so Kenny could kind of get the idea of how the vocals go. And after, you know, it didn't work out with Kenny, we were like, well, actually, Dallas's voice sounds pretty good kind of work because he was big time into venom at that time and he kind of was trying to sing like like chronos and so you know he became the first singer for morbid angel <clears throat> that <clears throat> was actually in the band besides from people we tried out and uh then we got richard Brunell. i remember i went to a party and we were talking about you know because trey loved to do solos half the night mm. and uh, and it was good because you know back then bands used to do you know, 20 minute versions of their five minute radio songs. Right. Yeah. You know, so we were kind of going for that angle where when we started playing, we would just jam for like, you know, 15 minutes on, on a song. And uh, so it, we ended up getting Richard in the band and then uh, Dallas would sing some of the songs and Richard would sing some of the songs. And when Richard would try to Brunel, uh, when Richard would try to sing, he couldn't play and sing at the same time. So he would always stop playing guitar and sing. Well, that didn't work, you know. So we were just like, let's go with just Dallas singing. But then Dallas got arrested. Oh, Jesus. So we were stuck with nobody to sing at that point again. And it's like, shoot, I knew the songs. I like bands like Exciter, you know, it was, was like a big band I used to listen to and their drummer sang. I was going to ask you, I was, I was actually going to ask you if Dan Beeler was an influence on you as, as being a drummer vocalist. Cause that's a rare thing. Yeah. It's very, very rare. And I heard him doing it and he's got a great voice. He, he yeah. can do those highs and everything. And I was like, well, if he can do that and play, I can do this stuff. Cause it's all, you know, there's no highs or anything in it, you know, and Slayer was getting really popular. So I was like, well, I know the songs. I know the lyrics, you know, let, let me try singing. And so I did, and it just happened to flow pretty easy. And so when I started singing, it was literally like seven or eight months later that we had got signed and recorded Abominations. Cool. So, so you cool. know, that's how it kind of worked out with, with, with me and ended up singing. Nice. And it, nice. you know, it was pretty good. You know, it yeah. ended up working pretty good, but then, you know, things happened and I ended up getting, leaving more of an angel in a situation. And, and, uh, that's when Trey and Richard ended up moving up North from Tampa to North Carolina, because our label that we had signed to, to record abominations, was, David Vincent owned the label. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So. I found one. Well, we, we recorded the album. We went up there and recorded the album. And after we recorded all the music, I remember David saying, all of y'all go home now. And me and Trey are going to stay here by ourselves and mix the album. And that wasn't what the plan was. Hmm. You know, we had all decided, you know, to record the album and mix it. So all of a sudden this guy's telling us, you go home, your job's done. We're like, what? What do you mean our job's done? You know, there was things I wanted to do on my vocals, you know, effect wise and this and that. And and I wasn't able to have a say so in any of it. And um, also David had hired Bill Matoyer as not really the producer, but the engineer. Because uh, the, the the studio we recorded in in Charlotte, North Carolina was um, a country and Western studio. Oh, okay. So the two engineers that owned the studio, it was a great studio, but they didn't know anything about metal back then. 
because you're talking 1986. Yeah. So he wanted Bill Matoyer to mix the record. And uh, David produced it, basically. But I don't know what that really was because I wasn't even there for that part. So after we recorded all our parts, we were sent home. And Trey stayed up there with David. And when he came back, he stayed up there for like a week and a half and came back. And he just was like a completely different person hmm. when he came back. I don't know what went on during that time, but he came back and was like, we got to get rid of our bass player. David said he knows another bass player. Uh, what we're going to do is get rid of John Ortega, who played bass on the record. And he knows this guy Sterling uh, that lives in Atlanta, and he's going to come down and try out for us. And if he works out, we're going to have him replace all the bass tracks on the record. That's why Abominations didn't come out right away. Oh, uh, okay. So Sterling ended up joining the band. But like his situation was he had a band called Incubus in Atlanta. And he said, well, I've got some really good songs. And if I join Morbid an Angel, I want to use my songs in Morbid an Angel. So those, uh, that Incubus demo I did with the three songs on it, mm -hmm. um, those songs were actually going to be Morbid an Angel songs. Oh, wow. And there's a practice, there's a Morbid an Angel practice from 1986 where I'm actually singing uh you know those incubus songs as morbid angel wow so when morbid angel split in half sterling and i stayed in tampa and richard and and uh trey moved up there and started playing with uh with with david vincent and uh his drummer that he already he had a band up there his drummer was uh wayne hartzell okay so he's the one that played on thy kingdom come demo he played drums on that gotcha before he, so there was a drummer between me and Pete. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. That's interesting. Yeah. And if you look at the Thy Kingdom Come demo, and I think it's only what, two songs. Um, yeah. But he uh, he played on that. Or maybe there's three songs on that one. Uh, so that's kind of like what happened there. And Sterling's like, well, it doesn't matter because I have Incubus and I got a bunch of songs, so we'll just do Incubus. I was like, yeah, okay. You know, why not? Let's do it. Because they were good songs. Yeah. So we, we uh, incorporated a guitar player named Gino and became a three piece and did the Incubus demo. And that only lasted like six months because Sterling ended up being a complete maniac. And uh, him and Gino got into a fight one day while I was at work and beat each other up. Oh, geez. And he quit. Gino quit. And I was just tired of so much drama and fighting right. and drinking and all that. So I, at that point, I was just like, you know what? I'm quitting too, and I'm going to start my own band with my own name and my own ideas, and that's when I did Nocturnus. Gotcha. And did, when, you, when you started Nocturnus, did you initially, did you decide from the get-go, like, I'm going to sing as well? Did you, had, had yeah. you kind of gotten the bug then and like, all right, I'm going to be a drummer singer? Yeah. Well, the thing, you know, in, a, in Incubus, I didn't do that. Um, but in Morbid Angel, it did, so I knew I could. Yeah. And uh, I didn't mind in, in Incubus because Sterling wrote all the lyrics and the music, you know, and he wanted to sing. So I was like, yeah, no problem. I'll just sit back and play drums on this because it was very tough stuff for 1987. If you listen to those three, God Died on His Knees, Engulfed in Unspeakable Horror, and Reanimator's Mutilations, those songs are really fast and brutal for that time. Yeah. And uh, so I was like, kind of like happy and not having to sing and play that stuff because when he wrote it, I, you had to sing a million miles an hour like Tom Array used to sing really fast. Yeah. You know, remember, 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 remember. you know, and I couldn't sing and play drums that fast. I was like, this is kind of hard to do. And I didn't, I didn't want to work to play in a band. I wanted to enjoy it, what I was playing. You know, so when Incubus split up, I was kind of happy. You know, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to go back to what I want to do now. And uh, I hooked up with uh, Richard Bateman who had just, he was in, he was in Agent Steel. Oh, yeah. He was on tour with them, and, and he said uh, the singer, Cyrus, was just such a weirdo. He <laughs> thought he was the reincarnation of Jesus. Oh, God. Yeah, and he used to have, he had this little roadie guy that helped him with everything, and he used to make the roadie wash his feet every oh, night, like Jesus God. and everything. Oh, and Richard was just like, dude, I can't take this, you know, he <laughs> left halfway through the tour and they were getting ready to be signed to a big big label and when Richard quit it kind of messed the whole thing up 
and they kind of lost the record deal. And so Richard, and so they hated Richard. And then they kind of hated me because of that. I didn't even know the guys, but they, you know, they were, came back to Tampa. They moved to Tampa at that point and tried to get Richard back in the band and he didn't want to do it. Mm. And uh, so, cause he was in Nocturnus at that point. So it was just me and Richard at first. We were writing just bass and drums and I was writing the lyrics and singing and we wrote BCAD and a couple other songs like that. And uh, they were just bass and drums. Wow. And I um, knew this guy that had a band called Ent Ent Entity and it was Vincent Crowley. And his band had just split up, but he had wrote all the music and for that. So he's like, you know, I asked him if he wanted to play guitar for us. So the first Nocturnus was just me Richard Bateman and Vincent Crowley. Cool. And we had half of the songs that me and Richard wrote and half of the songs that Vince brought in from the entity or entity, the band. And on the first Nocturnus demo, two of the songs are Vince's, the entity and uh, Unholy Fury and BCAD and um, shoot, what was the other song on there? Nocturnus. Yeah. Where, you know, so it was like kind of like half me and Richard's stuff and half Vince's stuff. And then right before we went to record, we got Gino back in the in the band because Gino was an incubus. And Sterling had went back to Atlanta. Oh, okay. When when Incubus split up, he moved back to Atlanta. So he was out of the picture completely. And uh so you know, we got Gino back in there because we wanted to have you know the dual leads and harmonies and things like that. So we got Gino in the band and then we recorded the first demo. And right after that happened, things were starting to go good. And Nasty Savage had lost their bass player. He was on, on tour and he put his hand through a, a plate glass window and just cut all the tendons in his arm and everything and couldn't play wow. bass anymore for years. And uh, so he had to quit the band and they needed a bass player and they already had festivals in Poland and, they had the first album out already and they asked Richard to join the band. Oh, wow. And Richard was like, this is a big opportunity. And I, I couldn't blame him. I mean, all we had was like a, a little demo out and we weren't signed or anything. And, and, you know, he, here was this big band, nasty savage asking, you know, Hey, join our band. And kind of back then you really didn't play in more than one band. Right. It was cool. You had your band. So, he joined Nasty Savage, and at that point, Vince and uh, Gino kind of weren't getting along, guitar-wise. And uh, so Vince was like, you know, I'm done with Florida. I don't like the heat. I'm going to move up north. So he left to make his own band, which ended up being Asheron. And uh, we got Gino's cousin. Uh, Gino said, I got a cousin, little cousin that plays guitar, and he's been taking a lot of lessons, and he's really good which ended up being Mike Davis. Oh, okay. So Mike Davis joined the band and it was me and Gino, Mike Davis. And uh, we got another bass player uh, that was friends with Mike and Gino. He knew Mike and Jeff Estes. So we ended up being a four piece at that point and we were gonna record the next album and I wanted to have intros that were keyboards. Because I used to get demos all the time from you know when we traded demos back in the 80s. Yeah. And I used to hear these demos, and most people would end up using like something from a movie like the the omen. Oh yeah. Right. You know, so they would use this intro that you know somebody else wrote, and it would sound amazing. And then the demo would start that was recorded in a garage. Yeah. <laughs> and then you would never hear anything else, you know, that sounded like and no keyboards anymore. So there would be an intro and then bam, the music would start and it would sound totally different from the intro. Uh, Cause you know, they would take it from a movie. Right. We didn't want that to happen. So I said, let's find a keyboard player, you know, that can write us some intros for, for our next demo. And they, uh, they knew each other. Uh, they knew this guy named Lou and you know, we, they all went to school together. So they all knew each other. And he, yeah, we know a keyboard player. And he, he, he's got this insonic, cool keyboard that makes all kinds of weird sounds. So we told him to write two intros. And he wrote two intros for us and then came to our warehouse. And he hooked the keyboards up through the PA. 
because we said this big massive pv speaker pa you know back then and uh so he hooked his keyboards up and he played the intro for us and it sounded really cool it was ecad wow. intro so it's like we he played it for us and we were like okay play that intro and we'll go into it you know in the warehouse so he played the intro and then we started the song so we were playing the song and he started like kind of playing along with us during the parts and we're like damn this sounds good yeah and, and uh well let's try another song and so we did another song and he started trying to play parts along with us and it's like it worked really well so we asked him if you know we're getting ready to do a demo instead of just doing these you know keyboard intros for us and not having anything more again why don't you you know learn the parts in these songs and and uh join the band and he was like okay he had never been in a band before either so it kind of worked out pretty good so when we did the science of horror demo in 88 he literally joined the band like a month before we recorded the demo oh cool and um i was back then uh you know sabotage was a, a full metal band and, and uh john was in john you know um he was oliva he was in <clears throat> a small studio in uh, st pete recording back then those kind of bands they were signed to atlantic so they were already big and they were getting ready to do their next album and so they had a big budget and they rented a, a small studio for like a month to go in and do pre-production for you know they recorded like 20 songs oh wow and that's what bands used to do back then they used to go record like you know 10 20 songs and then they'd pick out you know seven or eight of them for the record right yeah and uh, so they were doing that, and I saw John out somewhere <clears throat> in a bar, and I said, you know, he was like, I was talking to him, and he was like, yeah, we're in the studio doing this, and um, I said, yeah, we're just about ready to record our record, but I'm not sure where to go, you know, <clears throat> so I said, how's that studio you're working in, <clears throat> and he said, um, he said, well, we got the studio booked till the end of the month, and I'm almost done, he goes, we're in the mixing process of just mixing these demo songs, so he goes, if you want to come in on a weekend, you know, give me 500 bucks and I'll do your demo for you. Oh, cool. So I was like, well, that's the deal of the century, Yeah. you know? So we went into the studio and recorded and John really liked the stuff that we were doing because it was different, you know, with the keyboards and of course, you know, Sabotage has a big bunch of keyboards and stuff too, mm -hmm. piano, keyboards, all that. And he's, John plays all that stuff. He plays drums, he plays guitar, he sings keyboards everything piano he's a multi-talented guy uh, of course you can he writes a lot of the trans-siberian stuff too right you know? yeah but um, this was even before that and so john ended up not just recording us but he mixed it and he actually sang some backups on the demo oh cool you know we're doing the backups and we're like hey you want to sing a couple parts with this he's like yeah why not so he ended up singing backups on on the science of horror which was really cool. That's really and, cool. Um, so we put out the record and, and he knew how to mix. I guess we were considered death metal at that point, but he knew how to mix keyboards in, into a rock band hmm. with Sabotage. So since we had a keyboard player, he was he knew exactly how to make that sound work with the music and not be a separate thing. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we put out the science of horror and it just like took off like crazy. And we weren't expecting that to happen, but we got signed with earache and all that happened, you know, from that situation. Very cool. That's fascinating. That's, that's I love this history. Like you know, a lot of this, you know, you don't, you hear like little rumors about things and, but I, I'm always fascinated by the, yeah, especially like kind of the recording sessions and how, how, how it all actually happened, how these songs were written, how bands were formed. I'm, I'm always fascinated by this. I kind of geek out on it. I think it's, it's fascinating to me that. Um, yeah. For us, I mean, every band has a different way they write their material, you know, I think. And, but for us, every band I've been in seems to be where we write the music first and then we put fit the lyrics in after. Yeah. Yeah. And I still do that to this day. Oh, okay. <laughs> So it makes it, it makes it a lot easier for me, uh, especially singing and playing drums. Right. Do you so have a, do, 
a recording of the song and I try to get them to, all right, where do you want to put your leads? Yeah. So, so we had the guitar players, it's like, you guys figure out what rhythms you want the leads to be in. So we'll do a recording of the song with the leads, even if it's just a jam box recording. Then I'll take that recording and add, you know, sit down with it and write the vocals to it and write parts that I know I can sing and play. Like some of the rhythms, like, oh, shoot, I don't want to sing <laughs> right. over this because this is too, too weird, you know, and I wouldn't even know where to put the lyrics. So it was kind of good because I was able to fit the lyrics in to the music and it worked for me to be able to sing and play it at the same time. So you, you mentioned that, you know, you're, you're writing the music first and then the lyrics come later, but, uh, you know, especially like let's say with paradox, like, did you have kind of a basic concept like thematically of what you wanted to do, um, as you were writing the music and like, okay, I kind of want to tell this story, you know, you didn't necessarily have lyrics yet, but like, here's kind of where I want to go with this story. You know, here's right. kind of what, what I want the music to sound like. Well, we had, uh, the first song we wrote was called the Annie chamber. Oh yeah. And very cool song. I wanted that to continue where empire dropped, you know, went off and what happened next right after empire of the sands was going to be the Annie chamber. And when we wrote that song, that was exactly what I was going for. You know, let's write the music. And we wrote the music. And uh, like I said before, it's, it was an E flat. And we were used to playing everything in D. Even when we played the Nocturnus stuff live and after death, everything was in D so that the song sounded a little different. They didn't sound exactly like the key. They were a little lower in tuning. Not a lot, but enough to where it sounded a little strange, you know, because um, the songs were written in E flat. So when we went to E flat and started writing the Annie Chamber, right away, I was like, well, I got to make the lyrics continue on from Empire of the Sands. Yeah. And I realized, well, there's four songs that do that. I don't want to write a full concept record where every single song is the story. You know, like say Queensryche did with the Empire yeah. or something like that. I didn't want to be stuck to every album we do having the whole album be this the key story over and over and over again you know continuing yeah. so i thought well if i do four songs you know because we had neolithic you know visions from beyond the grave lake of fire none of that stuff really fit in with the key story so i thought well you know i want to continue some of these other songs too in their aspects like neolithic and uh so when we wrote it you know that i said well we're going to do four songs to continue the key story on every record from now on cool. and then the rest of the record could be you know continuation of this or that or just whatever kind of song and so that's the way we kind of looked at it and it was really strange i wrote in you know uh, annie chamber the lyrics and from then i really wasn't sure i mean there were so many different ways i could have took the lyrics from there it just kind of started i had this idea and it just kind of took off on its own and then the whole thing kind of became clear as to what I wanted to do lyric-wise with the key story. <clears throat> and, you know, Neolithic, of course, that wrote itself, the next song, you know, Paleolithic, because that's just, you know, if you look at periods in time, yeah. Neolithic, Paleolithic, you know, Mes Mes Mesolithic is the next one, which will be on the next record. So there are areas in time that are real. So those went in time, I already knew, or in the next two, you know, the first two Nocturnus AD albums where I was going to go with that. And I wanted to continue Lake of Fire and Staining of Blood. So I knew where that had to go. And it was weird when I wrote Seizing the Throne, I continued from Standing in Blood to Seizing the Throne. And then when I wrote that, I looked back and I said, man, this is really strange, but the song Nocturnus is the next set of lyrics <laughs> cool. that I wrote back in 1987. So I said, well, I don't want to, you know, make it a, a new song. I want to use that song because those lyrics fit perfect. They close that story out pretty much. Well, I mean, I could even continue it on the next album Yeah. Um, after that. But it kind of finished itself. So we, we thought of doing Nocturnus again, but just kind of revamping it and, you know, throwing a couple new parts in, but keeping the song basically the same and the lyrics the same. So that's going to be on the next album. Cool. So, I mean, the next album after that, I could actually write another song that continues from where, 
Nocturnus left off that song right. Nocturnus. And then I could do another song after Mesolithic. I could do that, or I could even go back to like prehistoric, you know? All right. So it, it, it kind of like almost started writing itself. Yeah. That's cool. Where it needed to go. I love the fact that, yeah, there's all this, you have all these ideas and all this material it's flowing. It's great. That's which, which is good as a fan, because that means we're going to hear a lot more music in the, hopefully not too distant future, <laughs> which I'm very well, excited about. Awesome. You know, like I said, it's pretty much all written. Awesome. Except for one song, I still got to write lyrics for, but that's not going to be connected to anything else. It'll just be another song, uh, a single song. Like we had a couple of those on Paradox. So after Paradox, the next album, we got that all written pretty much, but I already know where I'm taking the next four key songs, you know, after Paradox and this new album. I've already known where I'm going to have to take those next four songs on the next album, besides this next album. <laughs> nice. And it's actually going to take, besides from this next album after Paradox, it's going to take two more albums after that to complete this part of the story. Wow. And it leaves off, it would leave off to where it could go anywhere after that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's kind of like, a, you know, looked at things that like, for me, I, I loved comic books. Me you know, too. things like, of course, like, you know, Fantastic Four and Marvel comic books were my favorite. And and uh, so I kind of, and that was big sci-fi stuff, Marvel comic books, of course. Yeah. And you see what the movies have become from these 1970s comic books. You know, they've turned into these multi-billion dollar franchises. All right. With the multiverse now, the Marvel multiverse and all that. So I thought, man, I could do that with what we're doing here. Because when I wrote The Key, we had the guy on the cover, but he never really had a name. He was just a scientist that almost died of the plague and kind of rebuilt himself, you know, as part Andro. But he never really had a name. So I thought, well, when we started writing Paradox, I got to give this guy a name. I can't just call him, you know, call him nothing, you know, <laughs> because he never had a name on The Key. So I came up with the Dr. Magus name. It's supposed to be Magus, um, but I like Magus better. So I, just to make it a little different, he's actually called Dr. Magus. So um, I kind of gave him a name. And once I gave him a name, he actually just became like alive. Nice. You know, like, like a real character. And I paid um, this guy, well, I started getting into this program called Daz which is uh, 3D modeling kind of stuff. And, you know, you do renders. And so I had this really, really good artist named Yui Jarling design Dr. Magus from the covers of The Key and Paradox. I said, here's two covers. And I actually had the original cover too that we never used for The Key, mm -hmm. where he kind of looked a little bit more like Dr. Doom. Oh, <clears throat> interesting. Right, yeah. So that's kind of, I mean, I kind of like based... Dr. Magus off of what Dr. Doom was, hmm. you know, cause I always, he was always like my favorite villain. Yeah. So, um, when I, when I started with that, I said, you know, this is what he looks like. He's already on two album covers. Can you design me a 3d model of him? He's like, sure. No problem. And I said, I want to have it in the DAS format so I can buy any asset or prop that I buy. It'll work with. And uh, so I paid him to make me a really awesome Dr. 3D, Dr. Magus that could be used in a video game, videos, renders, anything. Nice. Yeah. So when he made that, it was like, now I had a whole different aspect of no more music with this guy, but he can go anywhere now. He could be put in a video game. He could be put in any artwork. He could be put you know, like in videos, you know, he could join the Marvel universe. <laughs> nice. I mean, once you had that 3D model, you could do anything with it. Right. So That's I don't know if you've seen the artwork that I do in DAS. I <laughs> have. Yeah, it's really cool. I was actually going to ask you about that. Yeah, I, I uh, you, you, you produce some pretty cool artwork, really fascinating <laughs> stuff. You know, like I'm not an artist. I can't really, I can't even draw a good stick figure. So when I 
realize what 3D modeling was, you start with a base figure that's just a very, you know, it's just like 3D man. And then you just take these morphs, you know, morph his arms out. You can put armor on him, you know, so you could kind of create anything from that character, basically. And it's a lot easier to do than just drawing it from freehand. Right. So once that guy, I couldn't do Dr. Magus. I wasn't that good by any means, because that takes really, really good art to be able to design the, the whole character from scratch. And that's what I wanted done with Dr. Magus. Now I can take a 3D model of a man and change it and make all kinds of other things like I do. Um, but a lot of the props and stuff are already made by other people when you just buy them and you can morph them, the sizes of them, the, the widths of things, the depths of things, and you can texture them different colors and, and just make it completely different. And once you buy that asset, you can use it for anything um, except for in a video game. If somebody else created that original asset, you have to buy what's called an interactive license okay. uh, to use it in a video game. But I own Dr. Magus, so I can use him in a video game without having an interactive license because I own him. But, you know, if I wanted to use, say, you know, something else like a, a spaceship or something that I bought, you know, I can change the look of it, but I couldn't use it in a video where you can interact with it. God. Unless I bought the license for it from the person who actually designed that, so it's kind of it's kind of a weird misconception. It's not really renders. Three D renders aren't really artwork. They're more like you have to look at them as like movie sets almost. Hmm. And all the props and 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 those every picture that you've seen me do, those are three D. So they're used with lighting and cameras just like a movie set. Oh, okay. So anything that you see me do, I can take that view all the way around the back of it, overhead, underneath, and change anything. Nice. You know, it's not That's like a nice. flat picture. Right. Yeah. Like somebody would do in drawing or in Photoshop. You can't, like, once you draw something, you can't go behind it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but with the 3D model, you can that's so cool yeah and i love i mean yeah the, i mean the artwork you know especially on parrot i mean yeah it's the idea that this that this you've got a 3d version i think that's amazing that's so that's really cool and that it can well, that be cover is actually that is a, that cover though i did have tim bull kayano who did that um that is a real painting okay yeah i was gonna say it looks yeah that's and a painting but, but i could redesign the whole thing in a 3d set and have that exact thing to where I could do anything with it. But uh, if you've seen the video that we did uh, for Apotheosis. Oh, yeah. He's in that doing things, you know. Yeah. So those are all 3D assets and things like that. And you can do videos, you can do renders and all that without having to uh, pay the original person that, say, did the, the chair that he's in. Um, right. You can use that if you buy the asset, but... If I wanted to make a video game, then I'd have to give him interactive license money to use that chair oh, that he's okay. in, in apotheosis. But it's kind of weird. And then I started getting into fractals, uh, like what's behind me there. Oh, that's yeah, a, cool. That's a fractal I did. That's amazing. And that's a program, too, that's free. But these fractals you just design yourself. It's basically that's mathematics. Yeah. It's really strange. So I've been able to take these fractals and use them as backgrounds in 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 my uh, 3D artwork as well. That's so cool. I love it. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, I've always, I, fractal artwork has always been fascinating. I've always loved it. I, I had a friend in college many, many, well, back when, uh, <laughs> back when the first Nocturnus album came out and he was into fractal, like it was somewhat rudimentary computer wise, you know, then, because, you know, it was 1990. But uh, yeah, I remember just yeah seeing the stuff he was doing then, and I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, now like be very strange. I don't, I still don't understand how they work. Me neither. <laughs> you basically, start with what's called a bulb, which is a fractal, and you morph that into whatever you want by changing the parameters of the math part of it. Yeah. So you add ten more to this number. 
and it changes the whole thing. You know, you had, then you have X, Y, and Z axes. So you can, you know, and the, the cool thing about the fractal thing is it's called Mandelbulb uh, 3D, the program, and it's free. Nice. So you really don't have to spend any money to do fractal art anymore. Yeah. The best program, they have two really good programs, Mandelbulb 3D and Mandelbulb Earth. And both those programs are free, completely free, commercial, free, ad free. They're just, you just get the program. They're really small programs too. They don't take up a lot of room. Now, when you do an animation, of course, you know, you have yeah. to do say, you know, 1500 frames. Right, right. So that takes a while, you know, to, to, to uh, you know, render each frame could take an hour. So literally a five minute video could take you 1500 hours. Wow. to render yeah it doesn't take long to to do the movements but for each one to render after you do all the movements it's set up like a film almost you know in in uh in uh what do you call this um shoot each uh frame it's like a movie frame you know oh, okay. a real, real movie you know has all the little frames so it's the same way like you have a frame of a uh, thing and then you move it a little bit and then you shoot another frame oh. and you move it a little bit, then you shoot another frame so that's like like how uh, ray harryhausen did with the old you know sinbad movies and oh movies. yeah the, the stop action exactly it's kind of like that in a way so you do a movement and then you take another shot then you do a movement you take another shot you do a movement and take another shot so it takes a while to right. kind of set that but then to render it takes even longer Depends on your computer, but you know, I've had three and four minute videos I've done that I just let my computer run for like two weeks. Oh wow! Every day rendering frame after frame after frame. You know, once it's all done, then you just throw it in a program that just sets it all up, and uh, you know, you got your movie. Yeah, that's cool. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't want to keep you all all day, Mike. This has been fascinating and a, a real joy chatting with you um i have one last question for you uh sure. i don't know if you're a beer drinker at all but uh so my blog is brews and tunes i pair uh craft beer with heavy metal albums uh so you know mike browning is kicking back on a you know sunday night uh i don't you know what what are you drinking and what are you listening to well the funny thing is i've never really been a drinker it's cool, cool. I, I rarely ever drink alcohol um, but I will try certain beers like, like, like obituary put out a beer. Oh yeah. You know? So I went and bought that, you know, I went to their party and bought that, but I do like, like chocolate stouts, things like okay. that. Cool. I always try those. The Yingling has a very good chocolate stout that they put out this time of year in very limited things. And that's pretty good. I'm not a big drinker. I, I, I kind of like red wine, Okay. Uh, but I'm not really like a whiskey and, tequila and all that drinker right right and, uh, i don't know it's just for some reason it's never been something that i've liked that much and when i drink i don't get very much of a buzz from it but i just have to pee a lot <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so I I'm, 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 like i'll drink and then i'll have to pee and then i'm like i lost my buzz <laughs> yeah <laughs> i can pee out the alcohol too right. for some reason you know but, but, so i just I don't know, i've never really been too much into the drinking thing but I will try things every once in a while, like I'll buy maybe a bottle of red wine, uh, you know, for a Saturday night or something, maybe a couple times a year. Or, you know, like I said, when Yingling will put out a chocolate stout, well, I bought that to try it. And, nice. You know, I'll probably buy it again this year when they do. I think it just came out again this month. Oh, cool. Uh, so, you know, things like that, I'll try the specialty kind of stuff. So I do like that. I think it would be cool. I know a lot of bands are putting out their own beers and yeah, wines and things like that. I wouldn't mind doing something like that sometime with a company that you know works with these bands. Yeah, definitely. quite a few of them do now. Yeah, uh, so I think it'd be kind of cool to design a either like a red wine or a, or a certain type of craft beer, you know, that would be either connected to me or the band. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, it'd be kind of fun. Yeah, you know? Paradox, the Paradox beer. 
<laughs> yeah, I would buy that. <laughs> I would definitely, you know, be into trying to work with a company on that. So if, if, if there's any companies that are interested in that, you know, just contact me on Facebook and let's work with it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I would love that. Yeah, that would be fun. So what, uh, what album, you know, when you're kicking back, what album are you spinning? What, anything you're listening to right now? Anything you're digging right now? Well, lately, I, when we get in writing mode, I don't really end up listening to a lot of other stuff other than the, the stuff we're writing because, you know, when we write it, I have to learn it after that, you know. Right, yeah. I mean, we wrote it, but it's different to learn it. And like I said, I have to listen to the song several times in order to figure out where I want to put the lyrics things like that so try not to get too far out listening to other stuff when when i'm writing yeah it makes things sense. Uh, i don't want to be influenced either by too many other things but I, a lot of times i find myself just going back to the old stuff you know like merciful fate old yeah. slayer you know possessed things like that and then celtic frost to make a theory on is one of my favorite records i can put that on like any time oh Think, yeah. you know who's a witch uh those kind of things I still end up listening to over most of the new stuff. Nice. Nice. There are some really good new bands, of course, you know, like, you know, uh, like, uh, I haven't listened to any in so long, but, uh, you know, the crazy bands like Art Spire and bands like that, you know, that are just, ooh, <laughs> the, the, the musicianship is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. There's some pretty wild. You know, yeah intensely wild talented stuff out there yeah i'm like none of these bands play like this you know it's crazy i mean i you know i know we're considered technical death metal too with nocturnus and everything but i still try to keep the songs sounding like a song yeah because some of the stuff i listen to it and it's like so technical and so many notes going on that once you listen to the song it's hard to remember yeah, it's almost chaotic. I would say, you know, it's unbelievable songwriting and talent, but I would rather have a rhythm that sticks in my head that, you know, right. during the day, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I can listen to that song in my head without having to play it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. That's the only thing I don't like about what's happening with music these days. And these, they're, they're fucking fantastic bands. But man, I just, it, I still, since I grew up in the seventies, that's the difference between music then and now is those were songs. They were very memorable things. So what we try to do when we write a guitar rhythm, especially we try to make it sound memorable and simple, but it, when you watch what they're playing, it's not anywhere near what you're thinking is going on. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, it ends up being technical when you watch it. It's like, but it doesn't really sound like, like, you know, a yeah. band would do. It sounds more like, rah, 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 you know, like that. So we kind of keep that in mind when we write rhythms. So they sound simpler than they really are. And they stick in your head. Cool. Cool. Well, Mike, uh, thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, cheers, my friend. Um, yeah. And I'll, uh, for everybody out there uh, watching this, uh, please look in the description. There's a link to uh, Nocturnus AD. Uh, if you don't own Paradox, go buy it right now. This album kicks ass. You will not be sorry. It is phenomenal. So uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. It was, it was a pleasure chatting with you today. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, for sure. Glad we got to do it.